Chapter Seven of Poison Romance and Poison Mysteries by Charles John Samuel Thompson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven: The Strange Case of Madame Lafarge. The story of Madame Lafarge, who was tried in France for the murder of her husband in 1840, is a strangely romantic one. Marie Fortuné Capel was the daughter of a captain in the Imperial Artillery. Her parents died in her childhood, and she was placed in the care of an aunt, who, at the earliest opportunity, determined to relieve herself of the burden of her support by negotiating a marriage for her. While still a girl, through the instrumentality of a matrimonial agent in Paris, an alliance was arranged between Marie Capelle and one Monsieur Charles Lafarge, who was a widower and an ironmaster of Glandier. The marriage, which was purely a commercial transaction, took place in Paris on August 15, 1839, after which Lafarge and his young wife set out for his old and gloomy seigneurial mansion in Glandier. From statements made afterwards, Madame Lafarge became disgusted with her husband's brutality before the honeymoon was over. After they reached their own house, however, they were reconciled, and there seemed to be every possibility of their spending a happy wedded life together. Besides the newly married pair, there lived in the family mansion the mother and sister of Lafarge, and his chief clerk, one Denis Barbieu, was a frequent visitor at the house, and had liberty to walk through the place without restriction. In a very short time Madame Lafarge discovered that both she and her relatives had been deceived as to the position of her husband, and that instead of being a man of considerable fortune, he was straitened for means. On his representations she bestowed upon him all her fortune, and even wrote letters at his dictation to some of her wealthy friends, asking them to aid him to find money to develop a new method he claimed to have discovered for smelting iron. With these letters of introduction Lafarge set out for Paris in December 1839 to raise money to start his new project. While he was thus away, his wife had her portrait drawn by an artist in Glandier, and determined to send it to her absent husband. She therefore packed it in a box, with some cakes made by his mother, together with an affectionate letter, and dispatched them to Paris. This box, which contained nothing but the five small cakes, the portrait, and the letter, was packed and sealed by Madame Lafarge in the presence of several witnesses. When it reached Paris and was opened by Lafarge, it contained only one large cake, after partaking of which he was suddenly taken ill and was eventually compelled to return home, where he arrived on January 5, 1840. His sickness continued and increased in severity, and nine days afterwards he died. Shortly after his death, his mother and friends, who were well aware how the widow disliked them, and her husband also, who had made her life so unhappy, at once imputed the cause of death to poison administered by his wife in the cake she had sent to Paris, and Marie Capelle Lafarge was arrested on suspicion. When the house of the deceased man was searched, certain diamonds were found, which were supposed to have been stolen from the Vicomte de Lauda by Madame Lafarge before her marriage. The unfortunate woman was therefore charged with the double crime of theft and murder. Though arrested in January 1840, the trial of Madame Lafarge did not commence till July 9 of the same year, and the charge of theft was first proceeded with in her absence, and she was found guilty. While this judgment was still under appeal, she was brought to trial on the graver charge. The evidence for the prosecution went to prove that the illness of Lafarge commenced with the eating of the cake received from his home. As already stated, when the box arrived in Paris, the seals had been broken, the five cakes had disappeared, and a single cake, as large as a plate, had been substituted for them. It was alleged by the prosecution that this single cake had been prepared by Madame Lafarge and secretly placed in the box, but no evidence could be brought to prove that she ever tampered with the box after it had been sealed. 
lafarge's clerk denise barbier made a clandestine visit to paris after the box had been dispatched and he was with lafarge when it arrived in paris yet no notice seems to have been taken of this suspicious fact it transpired it was he who also first threw out hints on his master's return that he was being poisoned by arsenic and told a brother employee that his master would be dead within ten days there was ample proof however that there was a considerable quantity of arsenic in the house at glandier it was found that madame lafarge had purchased some in december stating she required it for destroying rats Denis also stated in evidence that madame had requested him to procure her some arsenic he bought some but did not give it to her it was further stated that madame lafarge was seen to stir a white powder into some chicken broth which had been prepared for her husband the remains of which found in a bowl were said by the analyst to contain arsenic the medical men who conducted the post-mortem examination gave it as their deliberate opinion that the deceased man had been poisoned by arsenic of which metal they professed to have found considerable quantities the friends of the accused then submitted the matter to orfila the famous toxicologist who in giving his opinion of the methods and manner in which the analysis had been carried out said that owing to the antiquated and doubtful methods of detection employed by the medical men it was probable they fancied they had found arsenic where there was none thereupon the prosecution asked orfila to undertake a fresh analysis himself which he consented to do and on making a careful examination of the remains stated he discovered just a minute trace of arsenic this apparently sealed the doom of the accused woman and served to strengthen the bias of the jury but now another actor appeared in the drama in the person of raspail another famous french chemist who had watched the case from the beginning with interest on hearing the result of orfila's examination he had taken the trouble to trace the zinc wire with which orfila had experimented to the shop where the great toxicologist had procured the article and he found on analysis that the zinc itself contained more arsenic than orfila had detected by his examination orfila had used marsh's test which is infallible so long as the reagents used are free from arsenic themselves Raspai, having placed the result of his discovery of arsenic in orfila's reagent at the service of the defence was on his way to tull where the assizes were being held when an unfortunate accident delayed his progress and the unhappy marie capelle lafarge after a trial which lasted sixteen days was found guilty meanwhile and condemned to imprisonment for life with hard labour and exposure in the pillory Raspaia, however would not let the matter rest and at once set to work to save the condemned woman he at length got orfila to fairly admit his error and join him in a professional report to the authorities to that effect after being imprisoned for twelve years in the end the sentence on this unhappy woman was reduced to five years in the montpellier house of detention after which the government sent her to the convent of st remy from whence she was liberated in eighteen fifty two but only to end her wretched life a few months afterwards there appeared in the edinburgh review for eighteen forty two a careful examination of this interesting case from a legal point of view in which the writer states the strongest evidence indicated denise and not madame lafarge as the perpetrator of the crime it was proved this man lived by forgery and assisted lafarge in some very shady transactions to cover the latter's insolvency he was further known to harbour a deadly hatred for madame lafarge he was with his master in paris when he was seized with the sudden illness and it transpired that out of the twenty five thousand francs the ironmaster had succeeded in borrowing from his wife's relatives only three thousand nine hundred could be found when he returned to glandier 
on his own statement he was in the possession of a quantity of arsenic and he was the first to direct suspicion against his master's wife yet all these facts appear to have been overlooked in the efforts of the prosecution to fasten the guilt on the unfortunate woman that lafarge died from the effects of arsenical poisoning there seems little doubt but by whom it was administered has never been conclusively proved and the tragedy still remains among the unsolved poisoning mysteries End of chapter seven